Evening ladies and gents, it's uh, Simon Brown here, introducing Keith McLachlan for this evening's webinar. As I said, introducing Keith McLachlan, you find him at uh, Tebe Securities, he's also running a blog, sorry, Tebe Stockbroking, they changed their name, I'll get it right one day, then of course I can't spell broking. Um, he also runs a blog, smallcaps.coza, which he manages to update pretty much every day unless he's in Cape Town drinking beer, uh, which isn't that often. Uh, this evening's presentation really looking at different valuation models and I, I quickly went to Google and typed in valuation models and it came back with about six and a half billion of them, almost one per person on the planet. Keith's obviously not going to do that. Very much a top sort of level type of, of, of webinar looking at the different ones. Uh, I'm imagining in time we'll go into more details as time moves on. But with that, I'll hand over to Keith. Hi guys, good to have you uh, this, this evening. Thank, thanks for the introduction, Simon. Now, if you remember that uh, this webinar series is about uh, fundamentals, uh, and uh, we looked at the four pillars of fundamentals. Um, first of all, profitability. It's the aim of the business. Uh, you're looking for sustainable growing profits. Liquidity, uh, it's very simple. Cash is king. There you're looking for cash generation, working capital management. Uh, the third one is solvency. It's, it's essentially a, a view of debt, sufficient debt, not too much, not too little, because debt is a trade-off against leveraging profits for shareholder returns and the risk of business failure. Then finally, there's management, a very qualitative aspect of business, but arguably the most important. Um, all of this is building up background knowledge leading to evaluation and a devaluation will lead to an investment decision. Is the share undervalued or overvalued? Is the share growing faster than the market or slower than the market? Or in line with the market? So we've got to define a couple of terms. Um, this, this, is, this webinar is a broad overview of all the, uh, well, most of the valuation models out there and where to use them. So. In order to have that background, we've looked at the fundamentals, those four pillars, like I said. Now we need to define a couple of terms that I'm going to start to use interchangeably. Um, and I'm going to try to remind you guys of them as I go along, but let's define them up front right here. First of all is market value. It's very simple. Market value is the share price. It's what the share is trading at right now. It's market determined between willing buyers and willing sellers. Then you get fair value. Now, fair value is the calculated value of a share. It could differ from the market value. In fact, it can differ quite significantly. Um, and fair value is what you're going to originate or arrive at with your valuation models. Then you get, you, I'm sure everybody's heard the term intrinsic value. Intrinsic value, without getting too complicated, is actually really just a synonym for fair value. Some guys talk about fair value as being market value. They, they're assuming an efficient market. We are not going to assume an efficient market. So for the rest of the webinar, when I talk about fair value and intrinsic value, they are essentially the same thing. And that can differ from the market value or the share price. So the uh, intrinsic value will be interchangeably usable. Now, there's a fantastic quote. I would, I would love to know who said this. I, I think it might be Warren Buffett. He, he said way too many quotable things. Um, but uh, market value is what you pay. Fair value is what you get. Like I said, there can be a massive difference between uh, the share price and the actual intrinsic or fair value of a company. There's two major types of valuations. Um, First of all is market ratios. So it sounds like the sort of things they quote all day in the, in the financial press, all over the place. Market ratios are, are also an approach to valuing. You're looking at the price earnings model. You're looking at the price to book model. Price earnings model is uh, orientated around earnings. Price to book is oriented, orientated around the net asset value. If you remember, the net asset value is the same as equity, um, and that is essentially lying in the balance sheet. Then you get the price to sales ratio. These are, these are for early startups. It works well in biotech, uh, works well uh, in various other, other industries. Uh, but it's also, it's also quite nice for international comparatives because it strips out geographic margins which get distorted. 
you get a dividend yield model. Um, because obviously dividends are quite important from a minority shareholder's perspective. You don't control the cash flows of the company. You cannot tell management what to do, but you can earn the dividend as a shareholder. Then you get the price earnings growth model, or what they call the PEG model. Um, now, the, the premise here is essentially that you're buying, you're buying how, how much are you paying for one unit of growth? We will touch on this, and, and, and that webinar is, is, uh, will be in the future. Don't want to linger on it, but there's a lot of these market ratios, and there's one last one. And this one, once again, I don't want to linger on, it's going to confuse the hell out of everybody. Um, it's the EV EBITDA model. Best way to view the EV EBITDA model is as a debt or financing neutral price earnings model. Because if you're comparing price earnings between companies, but they have significant differences in their gearing ratios, i.e., the one has a lot of cash and the other one has a lot of debt, is the price earnings ratio really that comparable? In these circumstances, we use the EV EBITDA ratio, standing for enterprise value divided by earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. Not going to linger on that. That's coming up. Then you get a second major type of valuation approach. It's what they call discounted cash flows. The assumption in discounted cash flows is that the value of a business is the present value of all future cash flows uh, accruing to the shareholder or to the company. Um, the major one, you would have all heard about it, is the discounted free cash flow model, DCF. It's uh, tended, uh, guys tend to wield this as, as, as the golden standard in evaluation models. It's good, it has its uses, it also has its downfalls, as do all these models, actually. Um, then you get the dividend discount model, DD model or otherwise known as the Gordon Growth Model. Um, don't get confused by that. I like, the word, I like using the term dividend discount model because it's extremely explanatory. You're using dividends and you're discounting them. All future dividends you bring to the present. Both of these models take future cash flows and uh, bring them to the present. So obviously, if you remember our previous webinars around WAC, the Weighted Average Cost of Capital, that is essentially a discount rate. It's an interest rate unique to a company um, so that when you present value things, uh, you, you arrive at an answer unique to that company. Hence, these discounted cash flows will center very much around the WAC. Um, moving on there, market ratios. Now, just briefly glancing at them, there's some fundamental assumptions in market ratios. The people who use them may not be aware of them. So let's, let's state them here categorically. First of all, market ratios are largely relative valuations. What you're doing is you're looking at other companies, other shares, other markets, other industries, all similar companies and similar industries and similar markets, and so on and so on and so on. And you benchmarking, you using them and uh, getting back to your share, you're actually valuing your share relative to them. The problem with that is, well, the, the relative valuation is simple, is how is the share price against the rest of the comparable market? The assumption, though, unfortunately, is that you're assuming that the rest of the market is efficient and only the share that you're valuing isn't. You can see already that there, there could be massive flaws in the assumptions. If you were, were a couple of years ago to value shares in the construction industry versus the index, you might have come up with relative, relative valuations indicating value, but maybe, just maybe, the entire industry is overvalued. By implication, that means your valuation would be off. There's another fundamental assumption with market ratios is, the, it, it, well, is that it's an absolute valuation. Absolute valuation is simple. Um, you, You've, you're not comparing them versus the rest of the market. You're using various variables in the background to, to come up with a rule of thumb, price earnings or price to book ratio, price to sales and EV EBITDA ratio. So, that's, so you, you no longer have the risk that, uh, that your comparatives are themselves incorrectly valued, which are, but, but you, um, so you're ignoring the rest of the market. The problem is, um, 
that you're actually risking, um, sorry, here we go, you're often ignoring the longer term picture. These market ratios tend to be short term snaps of the market, snapshots of the market, where valuations lie right now, relative to each other, or relative to the underlying background uh, variables within the business. Um, so market ratios are, first of all, they're extremely useful because they're quick, they're easy to understand, they're very simple to execute. But they risk pricing inefficiency and they ignore the longer term picture. Then you get discounted cash flows. The fundamental assumption, the fundamental assumption in discounted cash flows is that the value of the business is the present value of all future cash flows. So the, the, let's say that again. The value of the business is the present value. Present value being you're taking all, all future cash flows and bring them right, right now. So obviously you have to discount. The further, further forward you go, the more risky that cash flow becomes and the more you have to discount it. Uh, and that's, that's where the critical assumption comes, future cash flows. Uh, so you're taking into, time, uh, into account the time value of money um, and you're forecasting, forecasting cash flows. Now, what is the major risk with discounted cash flows? Discounted cash flows are fantastic for academics. They make perfect sense in financial theory, but they have one major risk. These models have forecast risk. As much as market ratios have relative pricing and market inefficiency risk, because the markets you're comparing the two and the companies you're comparing your share to could themselves be over or undervalued. This kind of cash flows, you're looking at the future. So they have the risk that you just simply forecast those cash flows wrong. And that's very, the further forward you go, the greater the forecast risk becomes. Um, and obviously when you're talking about forecasts, you have a lot of moving parts. The more moving parts you have in a valuation model, the more assumptions you have to make. The more assumptions you have to make, the more chance you have that one of them is wrong and fatally wrong at that. So what is the conclusion? There's been quite a brief overview uh, of, of, of the broad two major approaches to valuations and how they fit into the fundamentals, the four pillars of, of, of equities. So the conclusion is simple. is the Share price is what you pay. Fair value is what you get. Fair value though, can be a moving target. So, um, first of all, share price and fair value can differ greatly. And that's, that's, that's where your investment decision, uh, a rational uh, investment decision has to be made the moment they start to differ. So, two major valuation models, discounted cash flows, market ratios. All these models have their own unique weaknesses. As much as, you see, I'm, I'm approaching this webinar pointing out the problems with these models so that you guys are cognizant of them when you're using them. doesn't mean that any of these models is better or worse than the other. In fact, in the perfect world, you'd apply all these models to the same share and hopefully all of them arrive at the same fair value and you, and you logically then have a lot of comfort that the fair value you've arrived at is the correct one. In reality, they'll tend to differ. And as we work through these models, um, we, we will discuss why they differ and when which ones are more applicable and which ones are more conservative, which ones are more aggressive, and how to apply each one. Obviously, the details surrounding. Um, but the important point is that all the models should be used in conjunction with the fundamentals. All the models should be used in conjunction with those four pillars of fundamentals. Profitability, solvency, liquidity, and management to arrive at a logical investment decision. Is the share undervalued or overvalued? Guys, it's been a fairly brief webinar, but uh, we open for questions now. Muted. Folks, if you've got any questions, you can put them in the text box. You can also, if you've got a microphone attached, you can uh, raise your hand. I'll activate the audio. Keith, two questions have come through. Um, the, the one uh, from Simpiria, and I suspect more of a statement than a question, perhaps, but nonetheless, um, and he says it, it's always about the assumptions. It's the assumptions that are the Jews word. The assumptions are the critical component of almost anything in investing. Unmuted. 
Largely, yes. I, I have to agree with that. Um, you know, there's there's points where, and this is when you start to become very comfortable with evaluation, is what they call a sensitivity analysis. Sensitivity analysis, once you've built your model, you've got your various valuation approaches, then you start to play with your assumptions. And you see, if you were wrong, a little bit downwards or a little bit upwards, how does the fair value react to that? Um, and 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 if it, it, so, you sort of play out best case and worst case scenario, and then you play out what you expect. You know, reality. Let's call it uh, your uh, forecast scenario. Um, and, and if and if all of those are still indicating value or indicating, you know, the shares overvalued, then you start to build up confidence. But yes, uh, I have to agree with that. Uh, these models come down to fundamental assumptions. But that is also why we we spend a lot of time and a lot of effort working through the fundamentals, because once you understand the fundamentals in the company, you have a much better chance of forecasting correctly and and pegging the assumptions to reality and not to hope. Muted. Question from Christo. He's asking, should I try and use both methods when evaluating shares? And I remember your chat around Clover. I think you use about a dozen different methods of, 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 of evaluate of, of getting. Unmuted. Well, uh, yeah. Once again, we're talking about a, a per perfect world. In a perfect world, we all have tons of times, so and you can work through multiple models using multiple assumptions and multiple sensitivity analyses. Um, yes, the more models, the better. And when all the models agree, they don't necessarily have to agree with the same fair, fair value. But if they all agree that the share is overvalued or undervalued, you can start to be more comfortable that you are correct. That said, um, you know we all have limited time, and, uh, and not not everyone is as privileged as me at work, working a full day, and this is all I do. Uh, so, so this is why we will have a webinar where once we work through all the models, I start to point out circumstances where which model is more applicable. So you, you can almost use a shortcut approach. Won't, you won't necessarily arrive at, at such a confident answer, but hopefully you're, you, you will arrive much quicker at a conclusive answer. Muted. Okay, and you've, you've answered then the next question, which was from Susan, who are we going to delve into them? Yes, Susan, we will. Uh, Luke asks, he says, most efficient sources for the input information required to do the market valuation calculations. I'll give Keith a moment to get to answer to that. Uh, Luke, your stockbroker should have it. The data ultimately comes from the company. Um, Profile Media collates it. I know the broker I use is online share trading. It's there, it's available, and it's in a nice format. I can cut and paste into Excel, and it gives me history back uh, 10 or so years. Um, if your broker hasn't got it, of course, the... the, the, the well, key funds that then change brokers, and that's not an unfair shot in the least, because then, unfortunately, the answer is to go back to the raw data, i.e. the results, and go and compute it yourself, but that is not fun. I don't know, Keith, any other? Unmuted. Should be well, a broker. uh, brokers, brokers are a starting point, but I definitely say, you know, you, you, what you're talking about here is analyzing individual shares, so another starting point, and arguably you were one of the more valuable ones, is the annual financial statements. Go to the company's website or, or request them from uh, CompuShare or whoever, whoever, whoever like, you know, relevant uh, places. Get, get the financial statements. In fact, try to get back the last sort of four or five years thereof. Um, now, th these aren't market ratios. These are fundamentals. So you're getting profitability, solvency, liquidity, and you start to judge management on the delivery. The market ratios you'll get uh, from your broker. You'll get from uh, the trading websites. Uh, but those used in conjunction are prob probably the two most valuable points. Yeah, what I do. You did. I do, and maybe it's because I'm just completely untrusting. Is I might get the data from my broker, and they'll give me some some raw data, and I have to go compute some. But I often go and check it just in case, particularly on earnings per share. Sometimes they use earnings per share. I want diluted headline earnings per share, um, and, and they're giving me straight earnings. Financial statements come in because the JSC has various definitions for what price earnings, um, which earnings per share measure you should use for price earnings, etc., etc., etc. So, so the raw data you can pull down may sometimes be distorted by definitions. And now it's no one's fault, 
um, but you have to double check those definitions. And, and the best place always to look um, to get a full picture of, of the fundamentals of the company is actually the financial statements. That's what they're there for. Muted. I mean, Sid Beware says more work. Yep, I'm afraid more work. But hey, if you want to be rich as Buffett, we get time to spend it. And another question from Sid Beware, which came earlier, he says ratios. He says, and I, I know I fall into this trap, I'm as guilty as I think that he's suggesting he is. Um, I'm lazy. I use PEs, I use uh, 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 peg ratios, dividend yields, and that sort of stuff. And he's saying from what you're suggesting now, particularly for long term, ratios perhaps are almost, almost unimportant, and we really need to go to valuation. Unmuted. Oh, uh, fair point, fair point. Uh, and and uh, depending on the circumstance, you, you have to give a greater weight to certain models than others. Um, but that said, I, I still believe that you're, you know, what you're working here is with a lot of assumptions, a lot of variables, um, So, and you're plugging them into a lot of different approaches and definitions of what fair value actually is. You know, this is... This is this is less a science, despite what anyone may lead you to believe. This is less a science and more an art or a skill. So you, all your fair values, both out of all the models, will all often be different from each other. So I'll go back to the more models you can use, and the more they agree with all the other models you've used, the more confident you are in your decision. Market ratios have their downfall. They also have their benefits. Um, yeah, each, model, each model in a circumstance is, is very applicable. Muted. It's almost to the point, and I can't remember who suggested this to me once, that when you're evaluating a company, rather than looking for reasons to buy it, you're actually looking for reasons to not buy it. And if you, if you use six models and they come up with widely different numbers, one says two rand, one says a hundred and everything in between, it's actually a case of, of walk away. Um, and it's that rare occasion when they all align and, 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 and are at discount to the market. That's an interesting perspective because when all the fair values and all the different models disagree with each other wildly, I mean, one indicates undervalue, one indicates overvalue, one indicates everything in between, and what is actually the end result is that the market themselves and all the participants in the market disagree. And what does disagreement in the market re result in? Some guys buying, some guys selling. That results in volatility. Now, volatility increases the risk of a share. Increasing the risk of the share increases, the, if you remember, the beta versus the market. Increasing the beta increases the cost of equity. Increase, and so we're going on. So, so it catapults. So in those circumstances, yes, that, that would definitely be an opportunity to walk away. You, 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 you want your models aligned, largely, give or take, pointing in the same direction. You don't want your models all disagreeing with each other. Uh, Fumani, coming to you. Your mic should be activated. Fumani, you got a question for us? Hi, there, someone. I guess I'm on. Uh, yes. Yes, uh, yes, we can hear you great. Okay, thanks. If a company is doing a, a share buyback, wouldn't that be a sign to say that most of the uh, directors would think that the share is unavailable, so everyone should be buying it as well? First of all, you have to start off where a share buyback, where the decision to have a share buyback originates. It originates around a board meeting. So already, if it originates around a board meeting, there's politics involved. And you have to evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I would love to say that a share buyback indicates a company is positive about their uh, future, that the share is undervalued. But in reality, I have a look at Angler. They had a fantastic share buyback a couple of years ago. Look where the share is now. Even the biggest company in the world can get these things wrong. So there's politics involved, and it, it's it, listen. A share buyback happening is 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 a better signal than no share buyback happening. But it's not. I wouldn't buy a company or buy a share just because there's a share buyback. Does that answer your question? Muted. I'm going to throw another example in there. Uh, Kodak, who traded almost at 100 bucks US, now trading below two, did a massive share back, buyback about a decade ago at around $65 a share. They, they, they spent an absolute fortune, and frankly, they destroyed wealth. 
And the other side of the debate is share buybacks versus dividends, but that's always a difficult one, and we'll come back to that another time. I, I like dividends. I know there's tax implications, but I like the cash. Folks, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through, so I'm going to grab the opportunity to end this webinar within the half an hour window, which we always like to do. Unfortunately, you don't always get to. As Keith said, uh, we, we're going to delve deeper into this. He's coming back on a monthly basis. We started with those four pillars, and, and we did we weighted average cost of capital, and slowly we're moving in to, to Unmuted. levels. Guys, guys uh, as I said, this is an overview of all the valuation models. Um, this is just giving you direction. We've touched on the four fundamentals, you know, profitability, liquidity, solvency, and management, as an approach to understand the company. These are now we start to delve into valuation models. This was simply a roadmap, and each one of these valuation models we've touched on now, we're going to go into much more depth on individual webinars in the future. Muted. Well, let's look forward to we leave it there. Keith McLaughlin, my thanks. Uh, as you've said, you find him at uh, Tether Stockbroking. You also find him at Small Caps. So Curzo, he obviously writes about Small Caps. Uh, go and give that a have a look. See. Um, Pretty much every day he's there and he's on Twitter at Keith McClaxon. Thanks to you all for attending. Keith, thanks for your time.